it's part of what we anticipate will be a mini year initiative. My guess is 10 to 15 years in various iterations. Um, I am anticipating that the next round of funding will probably come out in late 2015, um, just in time for us to spend our holidays worrying about it. Um, this first award is considered by us to be a pilot because the small number of dollars, but also um, the flexibility that is evident in the RFP. Most of the Department of Labor uh, requirements are not there uh, as strictly articulated as they do. So we think this is the what's going on in the world proposal. And then once they see what's going on, they'll say, well, here's what we really want. And, and the next one may be more structured or more uh, specific. So we're taking advantage of that flexibility here. Um, we've been working on this since December 15th, um, meeting now more often because we're ramping up in terms of five weeks from this Friday, we anticipate having our proposal completed and then would circulate to all of the partners for comment and certainly for correction of errors of fact. We want to be sure that we have a very tight and collaborative proposal, and it is taking an incredible amount of effort. So we're thrilled you joined us because we are getting up to our eyes in all the things we have to do. On our base camp, we have listed a number of documents, and I know Miles has shared a lot of them with you. Um, the latest one is our elevator speech. Uh, and we continue to uncover new pieces of what we need to do. We have five tenets in our program, and they're articulated here. Um, let me just give you this. But we are excited about what we're doing, and we are thrilled that you would be um, interested in joining with us. Uh, I wonder if because of the largest of the group, we should all introduce ourselves yeah. so you know who all is, is with us. Others may join as we get a little bit further into this, but if you would let people know who you are so we know, because we are recording for our colleagues who, uh, believe it or not, have other meetings and can't be with us. Let's start with the guests. And you start want to start with, with our guests. Andrea. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrea Young, and I am the CIO of a company in Boulder called BI Incorporated. We design and manufacture electronic monitoring technology in community corrections. Um, a lot of the ankle bracelet. Ankle bracelet. Wow. Yeah, she has the fancy way of saying that. Yeah, she has the fancy. I was like, well, that's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so my span of the ones you wear at the beach. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah different. Oh wow. Um, so um, our headquarters, is, our divisional headquarters, is in Boulder. In Boulder. We do manufacturing in Boulder. Um, we have a lot of partnerships, but I'm responsible for. Um, hardware engineering, software development, and IT. Perfect. Great. I'm Steve Satterwhite, the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Intelligence, which is an IT service provider to networking, infrastructure, data center equipment manufacturers. So we provide their labor force, and we hire, train, manage uh, different labor forces for them companies that make hardware and software and it's in your data center. Yes. Oh. Dave? Yeah, this is Dave Anderson, and I would actually love to be there with you this morning. <laughs> and I was supposed to be there with you this morning, but I followed my, <laughs> followed my directions and actually drove south to Colorado Springs from Parker because I thought that... We hear you're touring the state. <laughs> Yes, I am, you know, so this is all part of the uh, initiation program, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm the senior vice president and CIO for a company called CHQM Hill in Denver. They're about a 25,000-person engineering firm um, operating in 110 countries around the globe. Um, I run the IT organization. We have about 400 people in our IT organization, and um, – you know, we do everything from the local municipal water treatment system to the Panama Canal expansion. Thank you. This is Miles Pimentel, Assistant Director of Grants at Pikes Peak Community College. And Janelle Heisel, Director of Strategic Partnerships and Resource Development at the Community College of Aurora. 
<laughs> Marsha Mattingly, Director of Advanced Development and Compliance at Community College of Denver. Do we have anyone else on the call? Yes, this is Rob Herndon. I'm the Associate Dean for Business and Technology at Pikes Peak Community College. Fantastic. Well, we want to get started this morning. We have some questions. I'm going to turn this over to Miles because he's our our person of the hour <laughs> for IT. Go ahead. Steve, so tell me again, what you, because as you were talking about what you did, my brain jumped to a company we work with called Plum Choice, which, you know, does outsourced IT support. But I think you're different. I mean, it's like my yeah. mind originally was immediately went to that and then... Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's a, think of us like um, an outsourced private label delivery or service arm for companies that make hardware and software. Okay, so, so we've been in data, data center probably three or four dozen times over the last 15 years. But when my people show up, they say, hi, I'm Steve with Hitachi Data Systems. I'm Steve with Dell. Mm -hmm. I'm Steve with uh, NetApp, mm -hmm. EMC. Okay. So we provide the service labor uh, with some really complex skills to design, install, configure data center hardware and software for the manufacturers when the manufacturers sell directly to an end user company like Dave's organization. Okay, thank you. So Dave doesn't know us, he knows our people, mm -hmm. but we're doing it as a private label service. Okay. Yeah. That just helps kind of anchor my brain. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I think um, I just, we're going to cut right down to um, what we're all here for, and that is to find out in the IT um, sector in America if there's a possibility of opening up apprenticeship models. So we're looking for um, answers from our panelists to let us know if this is going to be something that's feasible, if it's feasible in your corporations that you're currently at, if you can see how it could work in your corporations from the information that you've read in the grant. Uh, the, the bottom line with this is that we got $100 million that's coming across America for about 25 different awards, and those awards are, it's really a petri dish for, for a test to find out if uh, Americans can put people to work underneath apprenticeship models. And one of the things we want to keep in mind is it's not necessarily the traditional model uh, that we've had since um, the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, there are some requirements that, that, that are going to be there. A minimum apprenticeship for IT, I think we heard from the Department of Labor, is um, 2,000 hours, one year, at least one year, and 144 uh, credit hours. Class, uh, training, training, hours. Training, training. Yeah, classroom hours, excuse me, um, would be a requirement for this grant. How that peels out from the, from the budget, we're, we're not totally clear yet. We're still putting that together. So if we could just... Um, Start Dave, Andrea, or Steve, we want to jump in. We want to find out from each of you at least a little bit if you have apprenticeships within your corporations, internships, shadowing, whatever you want to call it. And then from what you've read, what are your thoughts? I mean, we have some questions we put down, but we're really looking to see what your thoughts are. This is open discussion, so fire away. Lady first? Yeah. Ladies first. Um, so, uh, uh, in reading, I read the first 12 pages because that was the instructions. I <laughs> didn't read all, you know, 62 or whatever. You read the best part. Um, so, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I can't believe you shipped that off to you. That's cruel. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, you know, we do um, ha or have had from time to time mm -hmm. internships. Mm -hmm. um, the business of BI is really community corrections. So a lot more of what happens um, is tied in with criminal justice internships. Um, so those are, those are more frequent at our company than would be an IT internship. Um, but as I read the information, um, the, the internship is, is a, is not a new concept and, uh, it would be for entry level positions such as, uh, working an IT help desk. Um, a lot of, uh, folks seem to know their own way around their computer and so that's a good way to start them out. Um, we also in the hardware engineering uh, department, we have um, product engineers. And mm -hmm. so if they're mechanical, they understand electronics, 
um, they help us test um, a new ankle bracelet. So you have a, an ankle bracelet is basically, um, you know, this device, this um, mobile device um, with um, some additional sensors on it that has a strap and that is for being tamper-proof, right? Okay. And so if they wear it and they go to take it off, we know that they mm -hmm. tried to take it off mm -hmm. um, because it is something that they don't volunteer to wear. Um, so, um, so that gentle. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring any to slap on that so we try it out. Yeah, and I try it out. And so um, a product engineer is someone mm -hmm. who helps the mechanical, electrical, and firmware engineers um, they help them test out the product, um, be able to put it through its paces, but also create the work instructions for manufacturing the device. Um, and then we also have our manufacturing department, and so there's advanced electronics there. We have, um, we have manufacturing engineers um, that put the whole process together and make sure the process is repeatable. Um, and then there's another arm within the software development team. Um, there's software development in general, which is the programming, but report writing is quite a, a skill that is always in need. Um, so when we have our customers, they want us to write them a report, take the data out of the system and write a report. That's another entry level opportunity. And then finally, <coughs> testing our software. Um, so p putting together a test case, executing that test case, automating whatever we can to do testing of the software before we release it into production. So those were some of the areas that I felt like could be a fit for workforce. Um, those, um, uh, they might have a two-year degree as a desired, um, and then, you know, so if they have an associate but they're trying to get an apprenticeship, um, but some of them are ones that we can have where we could directly take them out of high school and put them through an apprenticeship. Um, but I would say that the most compelling part for me in reading this is um, with the veterans. And so being able to put veterans to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that is a really compelling angle in general for our country. And um, those are individuals that have already been proven in another in another context and um, and being able to help them um, re-enter um, as they um, come off of service duties, um, that would be pretty compelling from my perspective. Andy, can I ask, is there, <clears throat> is there currently an apprenticeship? Um, no. Okay, there's not. No. And if there, if there were to be the chance to open one up, who would be the person within the corporation that would help work with the design of it? Because you obviously just don't slap somebody in one of these. Mm -hmm. um, I would positions. say that it probably would be a collaboration with someone in my role mm -hmm. or someone who reports mm -hmm. to me and the human resource mm -hmm. department. And so I think you're at the right place of the organization, um, but being able to put that together mm -hmm. and put the right professional development, um, you know, wrapping around that to be able to make it su successful, um, that would be the right place to start. But I, I think that there's really strong potential, uh, and uh, I'm sure as Steve will talk about, that being able to, it's, we have quite a um, competitive situation going on from a workforce pipeline, and um, especially in Colorado, um, where there's a lot of uh, great companies here and, and with the Colorado Technology Association wanting to establish um, Colorado as the, um, the technology hub between the two coasts, mm -hmm. I think that there's going to be more and more attraction to Colorado mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, being able to have that workforce pipeline of technology professionals in Colorado will be very, very important and, and um, the community college system could play a big role in that. Do you, what sort of volume, do you, uh, hiring volume do you have annually in any one of these roles? Like where would the number, you know, if we were going to start, because you've kind of picked a range of occupations that I, in my mind, you know, would be structured differently. So if we were going to pick one, you know, that mm -hmm. would be a good place to start, where would you start and what might that look like numbers? Uh, I think that probably where I would start is, um, you know, I, I think that the most, readily um, entry point it would be the help desk mm -hmm. because uh, they 
Um, that is something that um, it is an entry level position. Uh, people come into that hoping for something as the next step, maybe systems administration or something like that. And so for me, it would either start at the help desk or it might start as a product engineer um, that would be that person on the hardware engineering team. That would be the starting point. That's where we see the most turnover. Where do you get people now when you try to fill these positions? Um, our recruiting strategy really ties in with um, a we go to a staffing agency okay. and do we do contract to hire, we get them proven in that um, and make sure that we're comfortable and then we convert them over from that. That's usually our, our source. Um, but if we had other partnerships that we could go to and to say that, mm -hmm. you know, this is, because mm -hmm. again, it's a great opportunity. It's the most entry level part of the organization where someone can come in, they don't have to have an extensive you know, set of credentials to be able to come in and be productive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be my starting point. I don't know about Steve and Dave, but that would be my starting point. Again, what sort of volume? What's your estimate? Um, I'm on a smaller scale. So I, my department is about 70 people. Mm -hmm. So I'm on a much smaller scale than would be um, what Steve and, mm -hmm. and Dave have. Um, but I would, you know, having, you know, been head of technology at Janus and other mm -hmm. industries, um, I would say that, you know, the similar um, but the volume is, you know, you're talking about at uh, Janus, it was the help desk was a 10 person team. Uh, mm -hmm. We did collaboration with the Route Bay mm -hmm. um, where they could do internships as, uh, as uh, high school um, interns. Uh, so, you know, Oppenheimer and Anna does, does the same thing. So, um, so those are opportunities where that's a good point to bring them into the organization and have them be that apprenticeship. And if that was something that I could mm -hmm. be doing all the time, mm -hmm. um, I would certainly love that because it, it gives them, you know, there, there's probably some um, great retention potential for them to convert over mm -hmm. from their apprenticeship mm -hmm. and join the company and have a career path and, you know, be a, a loyal a loyal employee. You think you could handle one or two? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I'm sorry. I mean, like, I would be on a small scale. Um, you know, go a couple going at any given time, maybe, you know, um, one in the help desk area, mm -hmm. one in the product mm -hmm. and engineering area, and maybe possibly testing a software. So, so a few, a few each year. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you. Steve or Dave? Oh, yeah, let Dave go first. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, all right. That's fine. So just so you guys know, I pulled out the road. I'm sitting at the top of Monument Hill. That's nice. Good it's view. a nice view, yeah. It is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's a great view up here, but um, I, like I said, I'd much rather be in the room with you. So, you in the U, yeah, you know, in the U.S., um, we do have an internship program. We're actually um, in the process of uh, getting that organized for the summer months. Um, typically, we're grabbing uh, kids out of university um, that are, you know, one, two, three years in that are looking to gain that, you know, kind of that summertime practical experience. Um, I actually had a conversation with our folks in the UK yesterday, and they do have a very solid apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might be something to actually uh, do a little bit of research on for you folks to, to kind of see how they've structured that and how the PPP actually works um, over in the UK. Um, you know, for us, as you know, we're talking about technology today. So um, inside the technology organization, very similar to what Andrea was describing, right? I've got folks that I could put in an operations kind of a role, um, and that might be what we call tier one support, which would be our help desk. It might be tier two or tier three, which becomes more sophisticated as you move kind of up the line um, to the point where, you know, a, a tier two support person would be answering a little more sophisticated questions than you would in a typical call center, and then a tier three might actually be doing some some work on a server or some database administration or some system administration. Um, in the infrastructure area, and this is somewhat similar to um, Andrea's engineering side, um, but infrastructure for us is all around um, servers, storage, network architectures, um, and you can kind of play those out as you think about what you have in your home or what you have at the university. Um, but it's kind of all facets of that. And um, to have some 
someone be able to step in and actually be able to address some of those problems? Uh, you know, I, I started the insur internship program inside IT uh, four years ago when I took this role. And it was basically for us to really kind of knock out some of the underlying projects that we just hadn't been able to get to. And so there was a lot of autonomy um, for the young people to actually um, come in, step up, take a hold of a project, and then move it forward to completion. So on the other side of this, and I think the other kind of interesting area, you know, we're an engineering firm. And we've got about 8,900 um, what, what I would consider to be pure engineers. And, you know, this is mechanical, structural, electrical, et cetera. And tremendous opportunities as we execute 20,000 projects a year. And so our workforce scales up and down across the globe with our project volume. And the projects are primarily in water, environmental, transportation, oil, gas, and chemicals. So you get kind of a, a cross-pollination here of different types of engineering skills. And then if you want to get more focused kind of on the IT side of that, it's all about um, geographic information systems and being able to, to lay out topographies using um, G, what we call GIS tools. And then there's all the CAD tools, the computer-aided design tools. And it's, you know, it's Bentley and Autodesk and another company called Esri and another company called Integraph. And the kids actually learn those very technical skills, how to use those tools to actually create whatever it is, whatever type of project they're working on. Hmm. So to, to kind of follow along your line of questioning for, for Andrea, you know, we bring on and let go roughly 8,000 people a year around the globe. And again, it just depends on the project volume. So the apprenticeship model would be, you know, something that I think would be very well received for our organizations. And, and I know we're talking here in the States, and I know we're talking about replacing uh, people that we may offer H-1Bs to. Um, but I think the opportunity is is pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and and then again, just to kind of follow up with Andrea's line of questioning, right? So who would who would we engage at our organization? This would definitely be something that the HR team would take the lead on. Um, you know, similar to we have a, a safety team and a diversity team and everything. Um, you know, we've got a college recruitment team and. And I think inside our organization, the HR organization would probably roll that up under the kind of the college and internship and apprenticeship programs. So currently, apprenticeships they do not exist in America, but they're 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 worldwide in your company. Is that is that what we hear? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, it's um, specifically in the UK, and I I don't know that I'd move into the Middle East and into um, into Asia Pacific. But certainly in, in Europe, in Western Europe in particular, it's a very popular type of a program. Okay. And so with that, um, those, those <laughs> models that currently exist in, in your corporation, Dave, it, if it comes down to where we're looking further for more information, is that something that you could research or help facilitate what, what exactly happens in the UK and, and how would that potentially migrate over into the U.S. through this program? Is that something that we could further explore later? Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's, you know, just a phone call away or an email away. So that's easy. And I, I believe this has been in place in the U.K. for quite some time, and it's really all wrapped around the PPP, right, the public-private partnerships. So. Public-private partnerships. Okay. Great. What about um, the question I asked about where would you start, like in the U.S., in Colorado, what, where do you think the sweet spot is for, um, you know, for a, a focal, an initial focal point, and then, you know, what sort of volume do you think we might anticipate? So, uh, you know, it's a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little bit away from IT for a second and go back to the engineering side. There are more engineers in 
Denver, there's more of a concentration of engineers in Denver than there is any other city in the country. And so if you looked at an opportunity area to get this moving, I would think somewhere along the, you know, it's a combination of, of engineering skills and IT skills, but I would bring these kids in at a ground level and get them involved in some of the geographic information system or the CAD design tools. Okay. That's where I think that's where I think the biggest opportunity is. The, the second play is, as you guys probably know, um, and as Andrea alluded to, you know, Colorado is trying to become the next Silicon Valley. And there are a tremendous number of startups, especially on the north side of Denver, that are striving and looking and dying to get people into their organizations to help them get launched. And so I think there's a tre tremendous opportunity in the entrepreneurial area to actually bring some folks in and help these companies get moving. It's a very low cost price point. The skill sets are should be extremely high. Tremendous opportunity to learn from the ground up, and um, you know, lots of lots of interesting um, tangents from there. Inside our organization, um, inside somebody like CH2M Hill, and I'm just going to rattle off some names, but again, the engineering population is huge. So there's MWH. There's a, on the north side of Denver. There's Arcadis down in the tech center. There's us, there's Black and Beach, there's Burns and McDonald, there's URS. I mean, AECOM, Tetra Tech, it's a huge opportunity area just in the greater Denver metro uh, area to really target the engineering side, the engineering companies. And if you get into the IT organizations, um, I think it's really across the board. You could put people in the call center, that's one area. Um, we could actually use some help in applications development, modernizing some of our legacy applications, so doing programming. Um, we have in the past put people in our PMO that had true project management skills and people that were primarily kind of dual majoring in, in uh, finance and um, IT. And we've had folks in our security organization, our cybersecurity organization, that were interested in that path. So, I mean, literally, you could take each one of what I call my departments, operations, infrastructure, applications, security, um, our project management organization, and our quality assurance groups, and we could literally slot people into every one of those groups. That, I know that's a lot of I know I know that's a lot of information, but I mean, it's, it's, it's what we need to hear. Yeah. Where do you get these people that you need? How does how do you find them? So you know, on a, um, we do the contract to hire, um, similar to what Andrea was describing. Huh? Um, but our you know our, we do the contract to hire primary in our in our help desk in our call center area. Mm -hmm. Primarily, right, and that's as Andrew described. That's a that's a training platform, and then it's a growth opportunity back into other areas of the organization. But um, with our college recruitment program, really, what we're doing is we're going out and we're looking for a specific skill set. We're looking for kids that are involved on either the engineering side, the technical infrastructure side, networking, for mm -hmm. example or people that are in the programming areas, very very targeted. Okay. Great. Who are the big contract and hire agencies that you're working with? I mean, are there... In Colorado, there's a million of them. And there's no one that stands out? It's kind of... Well, I mean, Robert Half is uh, one of our partners. Right. Um, Robert Half is one. Um, but, um, you know, that is something... Um, so Dave and I are both on, on the board of Colorado Technology Association. They have an annual event mm -hmm. um, that it happens in um, next week. Right. And that annual event um, is where it's a networking mm -hmm. event and mm -hmm. buy side, sell side get together. Mm -hmm. And I would say that at least half of the companies that are there to meet mm -hmm. people like 
myself and mm -hmm. Dave, mm -hmm. are staffing agencies. I see. And, okay. uh, and so it's, it's really big. You have the technical disciplines, as, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. Dave just talked about, network, mm -hmm. DBA, but then you also, the programming piece, but, but they, you know, there is a, a very high concentration of um, staffing agencies and one of the larger ones that I work with is, work with is Robert Happ mm -hmm. and they're, they're a global company, but, um, you know, then I work with smaller ones and I feel like I get a lot more attention um, and some really good candidates from the smaller ones because mm -hmm. they dig in and they want to know your culture, they want to know what works at mm -hmm. BI, who are the successful candidates, who mm -hmm. works well here, and then they tell that story and then we bring them in and then we have the proving ground and then mm -hmm. we can convert them and then if it doesn't work out or because we do a lot of, um, as Dave said, we have a lot of variable staffing mm -hmm. because of projects. We scale sure. up, we scale down, we scale mm -hmm. up, we scale down. Mm -hmm. And so contract to hire is a good option mm -hmm. in the event that something changes with your projects. Mm -hmm. You are letting the contractors go and not the regular employees sure. going. Sure. Um, but there's a high number of staffing agencies in Colorado. One of the ones that we work with most frequently is Comfrey. And that was a company that was founded in Colorado. Okay. Mm -hmm. Forty-two. So, you know, CH with the high volume of turnover that we have across the global organization, we actually use a vendor managed service provider called Agile One. Mm -hmm. And every organization, every department, every line of business, every legal entity inside CH2M Hill has a list of preferred vendors, mm -hmm. suppliers that we actually feed to Agile One. Mm -hmm. And then as we put a requisition forward for a specific type of person, um, that goes through kind of the clearinghouse of Agile One and they go out and they source for us. So you want to, uh, Dave, thank, <clears throat> thank you for all that. I'm going to shift over to Steve just to keep us on time to respect you all's time. Go ahead, Steve. Well, can I draw a picture of what we're talking about? Oh, sure. sure. Okay. So a, but you got to talk through it because they're on the phone. No problem. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I think this is what's really interesting. And by the way, I'm excited to be here. I've been dreaming about this opportunity for, what, about five years we've been talking about? Easily. This. So what Andrea and Dave oh, okay. are talking about is think of IT okay. Okay. really is two sides of the house. I'm going to oversimplify it. If I get it wrong, just correct me, but I will. So there's the software side, which is Dave in Dave's world he was talking about his CAD systems, mm -hmm. the geo systems, and your mm -hmm. world is programming development. And there is a lot of initiative mm -hmm. already in this side of the house. And then there's what we just call the infrastructure side of the house. Um, and we we're talking about networking and security, and they've mentioned servers and storage, and call it uh, data protection, which is backup and recovery. And then there's just basically cybersecurity. <clears throat> In this world right now, there's one million open unfilled jobs mm -hmm. in America right now. Why? Because there's a mismatch in getting the right people with the right training in the right seat at the right time. That's mm -hmm. why there's 42,000 staffing companies. That's why okay. there's vendor management systems that have to control the spend and the regulation and all the compliance issues around co-employment and other things and trying to source workers and stuff like that. And so think about it like this. There's in this world, there's the, just call it the manufacturers. And the manufacturers look like uh, companies you've heard of, like IBM and HP and Dell. And that's on the server side. And then on the storage side, there are companies like EMC and Network Appliance and uh, Hitachi Data Systems and, and a whole bunch of other ones, but that's the three big ones. And then you have, um, uh, data protection companies like uh, Symantec, which I think has a huge presence in Denver and, and Colorado, and another one that's kind of up and coming called Commvault, 
And then we can go into uh, networking. So companies like Cisco and Juniper and a bunch of other ones. And all of these companies are manufacturing hardware, like mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. a year old PC. Mm -hmm. And they also manufacture some basic software to mm -hmm. run the hardware. Mm -hmm. So just in their ecosystem, the way that they work is they sell direct to, let's just call it the, the, the Fortune uh, 500. Mm -hmm. And then they have tens of thousands of what we call reseller partners. Mm -hmm. And so resellers uh, could look as big as companies like uh, CDW, which is about an $8 billion company, I think one of the largest ones, on down to uh, companies like Foresight that are billions of dollars and companies like that. And then there's this kind of kind of long tail. So you have about 10% of the companies that are doing the bulk of it. And then there's like tens of thousands of these resellers selling out to end user companies. And even some of the, the smaller resellers represent the bigger resellers. Exactly. So and, and also there's distributors. Well, yeah, like Avnet and Arrow. Yeah. <laughs> Avnet and Arrow, okay. which are based here yeah. in Denver, yeah. who are also partners of ours. Right. And so what I'm trying to paint is that there's this map of consumers out there for the people that you can run through this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge volume of unfilled jobs. Are you going to get to what's the nature of the mismatch? Yeah, I'll get there. Let me walk through this. <laughs> the mismatch is, uh, and Dave and Andrea both walk through this. So uh, there's project managers or the PMO office. And then there are people that are what we call uh, system architects who can design what Dave's infrastructure looks like or Andrea's infrastructure mm -hmm. or their application. And then we just call this, this next tier is like a consultant. And that's someone who's actually touching the software that's on top of the hardware. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, uh, system engineers, which do the level two or three support and installation, rack stack, cable label, install services. Um, that's a huge part of that mm -hmm. ecosystem. And then we have people that are called system administrators. That once the stuff is all in and up and going and running, they're watching it and and monitoring it day to day. And then we have help desk. Okay, so think of this as this is basically a career ladder. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and why there's a skills mismatch is because these guys, all these manufacturers world is changing about every two to three years. There's new technology, technology is evolving, you've heard of Moore's Law, we're going to double the capacity at half the price every some other years. Yeah. So what happens is <clears throat> go out and say, let's plant a stake in the ground and start training on something today. In three years that skill set is either obsolete or changed. <coughs> but does it, it doesn't change a hundred percent, does it? I mean in some cases it could, but in some cases it keeps evolving to the point where you have to retrain your workforce. And that right there is the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So in a grant like this, what needs to happen is yes we need to put people from high school and underrepresented, or underrepresented populations, the military. We, yeah. we find military in the middle part. Yeah. If I were looking at a high school bell curve, this is the people that we're looking for right here. Mm -hmm. yes, I can. These are our best workers mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. I know it. I know it. Underrepresented minorities, military, yeah. women, you name it. Women. We need more women in technology. Girl power. Oh, yeah. There's your best workers that we have, by the way. <laughs> so we can't just we can't just train health desk right. and system oh, admin. Yeah. We have yeah. to level everybody up. Yeah. The reason why there's a skills mismatch mm -hmm. is if you're let's just take NetApp, because I have a customer today, this is one of my biggest customers, and their their guy that's in charge of this program is a guy named Steve Smith, who we met with last week. Steve Smith is thinking over the next five years. NetApp has got to train and hire, hire and train and onboard and, and skills up mm -hmm. about 10,000 people. And so they go to staffing companies like mm -hmm. ours or service companies like ours mm -hmm. to find that help. But what the problem is, is that there's a big disconnect 
So if if NetApp, and I can't remember what Dave has in his deal, you know, we've done a lot of work for, for Dell and his, and his uh, organization, but let's say he's got a NetApp farm of storage. In order for someone to touch that equipment, whether you're an architect, a consultant, a system engineer, an admin, they have to be certified. Mm -hmm. In order to touch it. In order to touch it. Just like you can take uh, your car to Bob's repair shop to have it fixed or mm -hmm. is under warranty mm -hmm. unless that guy is certified. The thing about these certifications is each one of these manufacturers look at that as a revenue source. Of course. And guess how much it costs to train put them into a net. Net, net app certified data administrator is about thirty to forty thousand dollars of cost. Uh -huh. I've been reading about this, and I've been reading about what now are huge lists of certifications from a number of these companies, and the certifications are very, very, in, in my vocabulary, very niche oriented. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. You've nailed it. And guess what? In three years from now, mm -hmm. the technology will evolve. Mm -hmm. <coughs> evolve. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole new platform out there that have, people have to get recertified mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So you can't just yeah. learn a job one yeah. time and be set for life. In the technology it's world, continuing you're continuing mm -hmm. training. And that is your biggest opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we can get community colleges to think differently about yeah. their model. Yeah. In fact, in my business, to work on, and, and we're in yeah. every Fortune 500 data center and big yeah. government institution in America, and to, quite frankly, I don't really care if they have a two-year or four-year degree. Mm -hmm. What I need them to be able to do is to have a, a NetApp certified data administrator certification mm -hmm. or whatever their corresponding mm -hmm. job title certification mm -hmm. is for that role. Just like you don't mm -hmm. want someone who's an unlicensed plumber working on your plumbing. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> what we need to do, yeah. yes, we need to pull people out of high school and teach them help desk skills. But we also have to take system administrators and make them engineers, engineers make them consultants. Yeah. And there's three parts to that. One is the technical training and certifications. And two, in our book, let's just call it uh, professional skills, okay? Because there is a language that when you walk into Andrea or Dave's data center, these men and women have to be able to speak. It's a technical language, mm -hmm. but it's also a level of communication skills. Mm -hmm. In the IT world, 60% of all IT projects fail. And the reason why is because of poor communication, poor planning, mm -hmm. and a poor platform to execute these projects. When we train people, and we train hundreds of people a year, hire and train, and put them to work at these companies, and they go out to Dave's company, they go out to Andrea's company, they go out to Walmart, they go out to any Fortune 500 data center. We're looking for really two things. They have to understand the technology, which or have the aptitude, and we can train them. But we also have to teach them communication skills to stand toe to toe in a situation that you're dealing with right now, which is you have an escalation, mm -hmm. And we have to teach people professional skills mm -hmm. to learn how to communicate and work through issues mm -hmm. because technology is a pickle bride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is yeah. our opportunity. When we do this, on and we call it skills, the softer skills. You know, yeah. Yeah. just yeah. being able to do that, yeah. you know, handle the softer skills, and that, you know, it's the the other thing I think that's really critical in all of that is not just general communication, but being able to understand context. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when they come in, it's not just about whether or not they knew, you know, the bits and the bytes, but they actually could understand and put it together in a business setting, and they know what problem they're trying to solve yes. for the business, especially on the software side. That's a really kind important thing. bigger like, picture orientation. Yeah. Do you all do trainings? I think companies, do they have trainings that bring people up on their communication? Is that a built-in? And, and we um, we spend a lot of time in that in terms of professional development. Um, but you know that's why those staffing agencies work out really well for us is because they know our culture and what will work in our culture. And if we're a certain um, you know we have a very pace setting culture um, that people have to work well under pressure, they have to be able to interact 
um, with the business. We're doing public safety. I mean, we're 24 by 7. We're doing public safety. If your ankle bracelet isn't communicating, we're not watching you, and that's a public safety issue. And so that's why those staffing agencies really help us mm -hmm. understand what works in our environment. And we're not spending time trying to source those soft skills. They know it. They know it when they see it, and they know what candidates to present to us because they know what our technical requirements are, but they also know on the softer side what's going to work in our environment. Do you think? Do you think that these staffing agents sound like they're in, they're in all of this industry? Is this apprenticeship model going to be a competitive? No, I think they're well. Do you, do you I think, think it'll be complimentary. No, I think, think complimentary. Yeah. That's why I have to do it yeah. because yeah. I think they have a vested interest. But in they're not going to make any money off it. Yeah, well, the staffing they, I mean, agents won't make money off it. But but you know one of the things that education Correct. and all of that well, is that you say that okay, as part of my as part of my talent management strategy, especially technical talent management, I'm going to use staffing agencies because I have a variable workforce. Um, and in all of that, if I say, to, it's just like HubZone, right? Like if I am a federal contractor and I need HubZone employees, I tell my staffing agency, you've got to go out and find me HubZone employees. they got to set up that HubZone on their, on their own. If, if, the, if there could be some kind of a coalition to say that in my organization, as part of my talent management strategy, I'm going to have apprenticeships and I'm going to have interns. And so you have to not only help recruit for what are standard contractors, you help recruit for the apprenticeships mm -hmm. and you help recruit, if that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's a, that's as a middleman because it makes it easier for me. I have three preferred vendors and I go to them when I need somebody. And I don't have to talk to 42,000 companies, right. right? And so if I don't have to do that and I can have a layer in between and I'm saying, you know, Tom Melaragno who started Concrete, you have to, you have to do a partnership with um, the Community College of the State because I want to be able to participate in this friendship program, then that's a coalition. I did it as a partnership. Your question, Miles? And, oh, yeah, I think oh, they, go ahead, Dave. No, I mean, go, Steve, go ahead and finish because then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on its ear a little bit. Yeah, I think I think in the other challenge that, that organizations have is no one can afford the training. So they can't afford a time off, and you know if you have to spend you know some twenty thirty thousand dollars to get a certification this year, this is the reality of it. Employees come in and they say, hey, I want to, I'm here, and I'm making forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars a year, depending on where you are in the world, and I want to get this job because I know I can make sixty thousand dollars a year. Then Andrea's going to have to invest, or Dave's going to have to invest twenty thousand dollars in training this employee, plus the time off, plus the travel expense. And guess what this guy is going to say when he comes back? Bye. 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 Exactly. You know why? why? You because the person down the street is going to offer him ten thousand dollars more. Right. And this is the huge problem. It, it spins these wages out of control. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be LeBron James, and they want to make a ton of money. And so the way that these staffing companies, because what we're doing right now is we're just taking people and moving them around in circles. <laughs> and what happens is we hope that when we move around the next time, the circle got a little bit bigger. But we still have a million unfilled jobs. If you look at some of the reports that the government's coming out with, there are going to be 12 million new jobs just in data security alone over the next day, decade. Hello? I have no idea. Hello? When you said... I don't know. Said, Okay, um, go ahead. Basically, <laughs> restructure. I'm not tracking what your recommendation is. I don't need people is. with a two-year degree. What I need is to restructure. If, if someone's coming to get a two-year associate's degree in IT, uh -huh. I still can't use that person tomorrow on a job mm -hmm. unless they have a very specific niche mm -hmm. skill mm -hmm. that I can train them on. And so what I envision for our organization, and have dreamt about this for a long time, is that we give people the technical well, training for free. We give them the training for free. Well, we're essentially free. Okay, so you give it to them for free, and we give them the professional, <laughs> professional development. But think about this. If, yeah. if your student is your customer, then think about them over the next 10, 15 years, they're going to be a repeat customer. So I don't know what it costs to go to community college system. If I've got it. Well, it's how much? Super cheap. It's, it's like about, about five grand a year. Uh -huh. Okay, so you're going to get ten thousand dollars from a student over a two-year period, right? 
Right. Uh -huh. Why don't we get ten thousand dollars from a student yeah. in a three to six month period? And then next year or two okay. years from now or three years from now, we get ten thousand dollars more from that student to level up in their skill set. What would happen, what you're describing now, you have a career ladder, but what you're really describing in the orange circle is more of a lattice model. Well, now, what I'm describing is the reason why there's 42,000 yeah, uh, staffing is because we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. We're not, and you're all robbing the circle. And we're not right? making you're the circle. We're not making the pie bigger. You're all doing that. And the way that supply and demand is, okay. if we can get more people all uh -huh. in all of these jobs simultaneously at uh -huh. the same time, Sorry, it was redundant. If we get all of these skills training at the same time, mm -hmm. it makes the whole pie bigger and it brings it accelerates, weight down. Right, it down, accelerates the, them getting into the position. I mean, like, it's but, everybody does. So let me ask another question because someone doesn't have to spend two years to get, Thank you know, a technical you. certification depending. I mean, is there a set of baseline, you know, kind of, you're saying there's a ton of different certifications, but right. from a community college perspective, are there some foundational ones yes. that are just good? Is that Cisco skill and, you know, because everybody's doing GCMA and that. Because we, in some ways we have the tools to yeah. do this already. Okay. Right. We can we can do a Cisco boot camp in six weeks if right. we want to. That's right. And you want to. But see, here's the thing. Let's say that let's say that I have uh, you know an employee that's skilled and has his NCDA. We'll keep mm -hmm. we'll keep that. And so now, um, you know, all of these other stores providers, and there's mm -hmm. three or four big ones, and and even some of them resell the others' equipment. It's actually kind of conceptualists in some cases, like HP, some of their storage equipment is actually made by Hitachi Data Systems. Mm -hmm. IBM, some of their storage equipment is made by NetApp. But once that person learns that base, that was a great question, by the way. When they learn that base you level skill set mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of enterprise level storage, mm -hmm. the software is a little different and the architecture is a little bit different in all these companies. It is a lot easier to train that person to go from a NetApp skill to an EMC mm -hmm. skill mm -hmm. than it is to bring them into a base functional skill. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's yeah. six months of how we do it today is we provide technical training, we provide professional training, and then this is the key part, you now we can get there, okay. just call it apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And my apprenticeship model today lasts from, it could last from a few days to a few months, depending on what the skill set. So what if we front-loaded people as apprentices so they would come to you with some of that credentialing already well, in place? Yeah, because that's what he's saying, is if we do this, if we find figure out what Those the baseline two. marketable certification is with the professional, the soft skills, that's a very marketable package is what exactly. I'm hearing mm -hmm. for okay. getting them in entry level. And then the apprenticeship can help with the advancement mm -hmm. into the or you know, however you want to slice and dice it, but anyway, I mean, I just mm -hmm. to get them on the path. Just while I, any, um, yeah. on the phone, I'll send out the whiteboard so you all have it. It's an interesting That's diagram. Dave, okay. did you have something? Yeah. Very respectful of time. No, Miles, so, so, so just one more thing here, right? So yeah. every, I, can, I can visualize everything on the board. Okay. And I agree, I agree, you know, specialization is a great thing and it's something that we all look for. And the dialogue up to this point is, has been kind of about what we're doing today. What I need you guys to think about is what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Okay, so last week I was asked to speak on the Internet of Things, which kind of takes you away from the core IT model that we've been talking about, operations, infrastructure, application, security, right? And now you start to get into big time data analytics, which again requires specialization and how you're going to use that to move the organization forward. And you start talking about the consumer side of, you know, what's going to be in your home and how is that piece of the economy going to start to grow and grow very rapidly over the next couple of years? And then you take a, an organization like mine and we're kind of, I liken it to the industrial side of, in, of you know, kind of the, the pie. And you start to talk about sensor-based 
um, modeling and monitoring and um, encapsulation of data. And some of these new skills are going to be in extremely high demand in a very short period of time. And if you guys can maybe think a little bit about what that opportunity area is, maybe you can get out in front of the curve and offer something that nobody else is offering. And I'll just give you an example, right? I mean, above and beyond the sensor-based things, um, you know, I'm talking to my senior leadership about drones and why shouldn't we be using drones out on project sites? And, you know, if you're watching what's going on in the academic world, you know, there's new programs around teaching folks to be drone pilots. And the same thing's going to happen with something like Google Glass. You know, I, I mean, we use it in the construction engineering and construction process to be able to walk into a big box retailer where we're doing, you know, the walls are stood up, but we don't know exactly where the structural steel is going to go or where the piping, piping and the HVAC and the electrical is going to go. And why wouldn't I be able to look through Google Glass and, see, you know, visualize with the latest set of drawings what's going on? You could do that in the home builder market as well. So all I'm saying is there's a lot of things that we need today, but the future is not very far away with some of these new technologies. Who, Dave, Dave, who has, I mean, that sounds, it's, it's out there on the cutting edge cusp, but who currently of, of major companies are, are really looking to fill that talent pipeline? Because you're talking a whole sensor-based data and analytics, Matt, marrying that up with the consumerism that's that's coming, if not already here, is that something that truly is in the college systems now and the training systems? No, it, you know, I I haven't seen it yet in the college systems, Miles. But you know, it's it's companies. You know, Steve mentioned a couple of them, right? It's it's Siemens, it's Qualcomm, it's Cisco. You know, mm -hmm. those are those are those are companies that we partner with every day mm -hmm. today to be driving this forward. Okay. So it's, it's just a little different spin, but if you, know, if you kind of come out of the box of core IT and where we sit today, this is what tomorrow is all about. Okay. And is there opportunity for apprenticeships within that? That's what it sounds like, is that that's a whole other area of where these companies are gonna need bodies. Yeah, I mean, it's an emerging market, right? And again, if you can get on the cutting edge of this, and you can train some of these people in some of the new skills, it's absolutely going to be in demand. You just watch. Okay. Rob, are you still online? Yeah, I'm still here. You got any input on that just from the educational side and what we're doing? Or Well, you know, in, in hearing Dave talk, one of the things I highlighted was GIS because we've had a real – problem with getting enrollment for students into GIS because, well, there's numerous, op, you know, problems with it, but one being people just don't understand it, you know, and the typical community college student coming in, they go into our big programs, you know, business, or if they are interested in technology, they might go into uh, networking. Um, they, if they want to be a programmer, They've got to have those math skills, and that, we have a problem with that at the community college level. So a lot of those folks end up in our information systems on the application side. Um, but, you know, as far as forward-looking and trying to do some training, you know, in those areas, I honestly think that's a difficult thing for our academic system, for our four-credit <laughs> process, where – you know, it is built around that, that ancient model of, you know, going to school for two or four or six years for a master's, you know, and all that, um, and coming out with a piece of paper. However, I think initiatives like um, we're currently working with Catalyst here uh, and the O'Neill Group in uh, Colorado Springs to bring about a process where, uh, businesses are co-located with education to where we could provide as needed training. You know, I heard Juniper mention, that's something that I've heard Kevin O'Neill mention a number of times is that he just doesn't, he needs like 20 Juniper people now, you know, to, to do jobs. And so, but we don't, we don't touch anything like that 
in, in our current um, model. But as we build our workforce development program, um, and we could offer, you know, those six-week boot camps to get a certification, uh, you know, a Security Plus, get you ready to take a Security Plus exam or something like that. You know, we're looking at models of doing that, you know, through Catalyst or through other opportunities. Um, I think then if we knew what the requirements were uh, on the business side of the house, then, yeah, sure, you could develop, you know, a program um, that, that looks at these newer technologies that, that are coming online. Um, but it's going to be a constant communication between the, the business side and, and our side of the house to really know what their requirements are and develop that training, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's just going to be a cycle of doing that. We can't live by – it's going to be very difficult to live by the standard educational cycle to keep up with the pace. Can I weigh in on that? <clears throat> what I think is missing in in general, and I don't know your community college system, uh, but what I think is missing in the industry is to get students into these uh, into these types of training programs. You have to show them that career path. We can post communication issue on our end too. Yeah. Well, you, I think that you have to partner with some kind of outplacement system that can put yeah. these people in jobs. The way I see what, what I'm interested in is working with an education facility, starting a foundation to pull in the grant, and allow and, and work and building a coalition of companies out there like Entry Admission to, to basically mm -hmm. Tell us what you need over the next five years, and we will pipeline those people through our system with the training, mm -hmm. with the professional development, and you you make a, a, a pledge to hire so many people, and we'll pull them through there. Well, and frankly, you know, I guess I think we're positioned to do that. <laughs> but, you know, it's just not just this grant. I mean, there is a lot of money. I mean, so our but, fear of influence is Denver, you know, the Colorado area. But I'm thinking there's H-1B money on the street now. I mean, if we actually have this, we could tap it on it. But I think the, the problem with higher ed, community college being one segment of that, is that they aren't really in the outplacement business. Yeah, but we are. But you yeah. are. Yeah. And we have not. There's 42,000 other companies. But we <laughs> haven't really connected that deliberately. Right. But I think we're in the position. And we should too, now. Because yeah. even the we should. big Six million dollar H one B grant think so. that Denver has. We have said, yeah, you you get the people to us. We will put them through a six yeah, week. Right. I mean, we can mix and we match do and it. speed it up and slow yeah. it down and we expand do the pipeline. But we do need the company partners that are, you know, that will again you can help with, with the hiring side, right. help with the framing, <coughs> help with the. Uh, well, we're selling the wrong thing in America. Yeah. We're, we're all talking about a step. We need more. No, step. no. We need STEM. We need STEM. No, we say, no one's interested in STEM. You know what they're interested in? They're interested in a good house, a good car, right. and a great wage. Right. We're selling right. the wrong That's thing. Right. That's right. Yeah. I'm wondering, too, if we look at this, and we're really asking everybody to do a paradigm shift with us because this is what we should be doing, not this take a class, do this, whatever. I am going to meet with um, – I met yesterday with the Vice President of Student Services, and we're going to start talking to registrars about how to look at and transcript this stuff differently so it's not all credit course, credit course, credit course. We're doing that in the context of stackable credentials because what really seems to come through is that the credentialing, you certified by this company to do this or that company to do that or you took whatever exam, that to employers has more meaning than it has had for us in the past. But we need to fix that, and we need to recognize that so that there there is credit for those credentialing that may or may not turn into a certificate or a degree. If an employer sees a credential of that type, it's sounding like the industry credential has more value. And we we have not kept up. We are very archaic in the way we record and transcript, and we've got to fix that. Because and I, I completely agree with that. That this is Rob. You know, one of the issues is at the state level, um, 
how CTE programs are, you know, validated and, and checked out is those completers. You know, who yeah. ha how many have completed certificates? How many have completed associate's degrees? Mm -hmm. And without that, you know, that's the data you're being judged on. So, of course, that's, that's where you're going to try and move to. So we need to, you know, modify that model. That's been talked about, you know, but this would be another reason why we need to go in, in that direction. Well, I have a commitment to uh, begin to start talking about that. And when I really was driving over here this morning, I thought, oh, my gosh, that means registrars and then degree plans and all kinds of things. But if we don't do it, we're left out. We'll do training for folks, but we won't get credit for how part of our system rewards us. And that is not a good thing for us. So we've got exactly. that as well. Right. What else can we do? Well, I want to be respectful of time for Steve and Dave. We're a little over. We're a little bit over, but uh, I think we'll wrap this up. It's a recorded session. Um, obviously, we're going to take stuff back amongst the group and, and um, put all this information into what we currently are thinking. I just want to be able to say thanks to Dave and Steve and Andrea for giving us the time to really give us some incredible information on on this apprenticeship model and the potential. I think it's what we wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just thank you so much again for your time. Okay. Very welcome. Let us know what else we can do. All right, we're, we're going to keep working, but we're going to yeah, we're gonna do this. We'll keep you up to date. I appreciate it, Dave. Appreciate it. Thanks, All right. Bob. Thank you.